I wrote this about a week and a half ago. It's a reactive, almost wistful response to seeing a trending article spreading a rampant falsehood that droves of people were burning J.K. Rowling books in response to her views on transgenderism and the transphobic character in her new novel. A week and a half is a long time on the internet. So at the risk of being late to the party, I've recorded and edited this fine video for no damn reason other than to get my thoughts out on the matter into the forgetful void. The topic itself and the take I have on it is pretty damn lukewarm. Without further ado. I appreciate all walks of life recursively, given that the person is respectful and has a sense of humanity. That appreciation ends at book burning. If someone burns books in protest, they've foregone both criteria for my appreciation of them. Actually, they're akin to an enemy, to me and the progress they claim to be in service of. I'm of the mind that people can do whatever the hell they please, so long as it doesn't harm others and is not too immoral of an act. You can burn books all day long, I won't stop an enemy from making a mistake, and I'm free to shout obscenities at you or dismiss your existence entirely. Liberty is a useful humanist concept, and we can use it and its conclusions as defensive principles to ward off those who left a wakeful reason for a darkly slumber. Sleep as you may, you're free to snooze. Just don't declare nap time and demand I must follow your parental orders or I'll be put in time out as punishment. I don't believe I hold strong views on transgenderism and its political corollaries. I don't think much about trans people. If they transition well, I notice I automatically use the gendered pronouns ascribed to them, even if her voice is a bit deep and her Adam's apple is pronounced, or if his waist to hip ratio is 0.78 and his voice sounds like my sister's. That said, trans folk and their empathic, occasionally vitriolic representatives need not demand a special pedestal as they've not earned it, nor should they opt to bend public perception in line with an ill-defined or poorly expressed ultimatum. Accept me, my ideological bents, heed my frothing barks, comply and do not question my motives, for I am oppressed by genetics. We're all oppressed by our genetics, honey. Societal remediation is activated faster than our understanding of its ailments. What do I mean by that? We've skipped the diagnosis and begun treatment. We must distinguish first whether a trans person is afflicted with a psychological or sociological ailment that needs clinical treatment slash correction, or whether they're willed to actualize an identity or personality out of the norm and contrary to their biological makeup. Excuse the shorthand false dichotomy, it works in the meantime. It seems the trans person will face suffering regardless of diagnostics, and we should be understanding, perhaps compassionate, in this process. Not at the cost of diminishing our sense-making, not at the cost of offloading the suffering onto unafflicted children. You can say we're past inquiry, claim that the science is out, but I and many, many others don't buy it and smell bullshit. Sneaky ideological smuggling emits a stench rather than omits one, and the trans person suffers all the same. After all, the phenomena of transgenderism could be a side effect of poor air quality. Improbable, maybe, but a sound enough description, one that blots out the ridiculous, unscientific claims like a person's chromosomes and sex difference has zip to do with their gender and how they express it, among others. Skip the diagnostics, go straight to the dogma. Why the usage of diagnostics instead of hypothesis? Diagnostics implies a problem needing to be fixed. As presumed, the trans person will face specific and certain suffering. Their identity or their expression of it is not a problem, of course, but the suffering to assume their identity is. Often it's of the surgical and psychiatric variety. Sometimes it's just confusion, an adolescent confusion that passes as time allows or a confusion that remains a permanent fixture. We don't know. We don't have enough data to support the claims we've been making. We lack scientific and clinical understanding. We should inquire ruthlessly and honestly while maintaining a mode of decency, always and without equivocation. Let's be frank. A growing confusion is riddling our society. Identity crises bound between and latch onto the wayward people without purpose or status or emotional stability. Increasing numbers of people are having difficulty discerning who they are and what their role is within civilization. This is a perilous notion and should not be dealt with lightly. It takes grit to struggle for your beliefs, to be actualized, and your place to be carved among our world, regardless of your understanding of your motivations, or whether the struggle begins at your genitals and ends at surviving post-op surgery. The trans community is caked in this struggle. On the onset, it's mostly contrived. The community's representatives have failed in making a case for solidarity as they unabashedly throw their weight around as if their inquisitions are brought out by divine order and not some nebulous dogma, as if they've done the diagnostic work needed for the treatment they prescribed. We ought to start making sense. We must make sense of what we mean 
when we push towards progress, rather than bandwagoning hysterics and subscribing to an informed psychosis. The path of least resistance might be carved by echoing absurdities, and the place you've carved for yourself may be a hell you deserve. What we've uttered unintelligibly are always shrieks heard by the ears of the future. We have no choice but to live in interesting times. Emotions are high, egos are inflated, and no one bothers to ask whether or not they're making sense. To the trans person who may hear this with umbrage, I say to you this. You were courageous enough to build an approximate of your true self through strife and struggle, in contradiction to external sensibilities and to the possible disappointment of your loved ones. You've taken on a difficult task of becoming and being. You believe your experience as a trans person is valid and have fought against those denying you the right to express yourself freely. It could be said that you're strong for having accepted who you really are, even stronger for visually presenting it. So why should a dead name bother you? Should the belligerence of others be suppressed by an isolated group of people, the trans community or its representatives, so that you may never face criticism or contradiction on how you operate in the world? And why do those who claim to represent you aspire to artificially inflict the pain of your certain strife onto children? If you need such reverence and deference to coexist, and if you cannot contend with an honest inquiry from your peers, if a fucking book written by a billionaire turf is to be a lit of flame and stamped out by your gnawing aggravations, then maybe popular acceptance of your gender identity should be the least of your concerns. And if you believe me to be simplifying or dismissing your struggles, then you've missed my point. While a silent majority failed to believe in the validity of your identity or the righteousness of your crusade, you failed in making your case effectively, especially if you find book burning to be vital for reformation. If you struck a match alongside your maggot-minded cohorts and burnt the pages of a more developed mind than yours, you've lost. you've lost. All because some British single mother who hit the lotto writing fantasy novels doesn't agree with your trendy political persuasion. You've tarnished your efforts and lost the argument. Why should anyone care what you have to say next 